You're listening to Comic Reflections, episode 188. I'm your host, Nicholas Prom, And I'm Jeff Barnard, a wrathful god who intends to purge the world of wickedness by drowning it. Hmm, that's never been done before. Oh, I, it, has, yeah, it has a ring of familiarity. Huh? Oh, it's in your imagination. Yeah, it must be. Um, Comic Reflections is brought to you by Rhymes with Geek. You can find our show, plus many other cool podcasts, like the all-new Anti-Fanboy, Super Podcasto Magnifico, and Ultimate Face Palm at rhymeswithgeek.com. If you enjoy our program, please subscribe to us on either iTunes or Stitcher. Okay. We have Kazar today. Yes. Kazar, 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 and more Kazar. Yeah. So. We're crazy for Kazar. <laughs> Kazerific. <laughs> it's gonna be a Kazer tra- tra- tragedy. Oh well, I can't, I can't go any further. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, all right. Oh, uh, that dead horse is definitely dead. <laughs> yeah. <I'm good. laughs> Beaten to a pulp. Uh, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so the first uh, uh, issue we're going to talk about today is Astonishing Tales number seven. It's the August of 1971 issue, and the lead story. Uh, yes, featuring Kazar. <laughs> in case you didn't, you were wondering. Um, is called Deluge, written by Roy Thomas, with art by Herb Trimpey. Um, and Herb Trimpey, um, just a couple of weeks ago, passed away at the age of 75. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a bit young, a bit too young, to be honest. I think if you made, if you make it to your 80s, you've made it. You are allowed to die anytime. But under that, it's like, nah, it's no, too it soon. It is average, though. Yeah. I'm a little bit, a year or two above average, I think. Yeah. But uh, Herb Trimpey... Uh, well loved in within the industry by everyone who worked with him, um, the classic artist on the Incredible Hulk, you know, who worked on that series for about eight years, um, and you know had many other works. But that's you know his his largest family to fame. Um, he will definitely be missed. I want to acknowledge him at this time. So, yeah. I wonder what the lifespan, average lifespan of art, of comic book people are. You that's know, it's more the same. I would think a little less, actually. Um, I mean, Jack Kirby was in his early 80s, I think. Mm-hmm. And, um, but then you have guys like, um, was it Dick, not Dick Dillon, but maybe that's who it was, but uh, a fellow who was working on the Justice League of America and did for uh, a number of years, he died like mid-story arc, and he was only 40 years old. Something no. like that. I have to look that it up. About, what... That sounds average. I mean, it's not like they're professional wrestlers who die before they're 40. <laughs> right. Um, I think of another guy. Uh, I'm really blanking today. Do you want to... Can you start? i got to look up a couple okay, things on my phone. we got um, Deluge. I mentioned that, I think. You did? Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we have an angry god who is uh, flooding the world and is going to destroy the savage land. The Savage Land or the entire world, I'm not sure. But for Kazar, the Savage Land is the whole world. Right. So you know, he's Lord Kevin Plunder of England, but he has rejected his his uh, you know noble roots, or frequently does, and goes back to the Savage Land. Yeah. Yeah, um, he has his friend Tonga, the Mohawk native. <laughs> yeah, Tonga is the leader of the Fall people. They're a tribe of, of mm-hmm. folks that live there. Yeah, extraordinarily well drawn. Nice yellows and reds. It's really, I don't know, it's just well done. Okay, there's something going on with. There's a spaceship that comes down, and the, one of the female tribe's girls or touches a body and becomes whole with her. And that was the angry gods. What's the angry god's name? Um, it was something like. Uh... I think it starts with Fred. Oh, no, it wasn't Fred. Uh, I completely blanked, to be honest. Okay. He, I mean, we'll never see him again. I, I think it was something like. I don't. I, I don't I, know. I, okay. So, <laughs> I didn't like the guy, the character, and it's the 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 immediate. It's this is weird story to have right after, uh, Kazar had already just fought another mad god. Right. And, and he fought Garrick. Garrick the petrified. Well, this is a little different. Well, he was trying to kill everybody as Right, well. but this guy has a lost love angle that Garrock didn't have. Yeah. But Garrock is just a cooler character. It was Dick Dillon, the, the Justice League artist I was thinking of. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, we'll be looking at some some work of his, not on Justice League, but uh, some other DC work 
uh, very soon. All right. Well, the the god is kicking butt, and Kazar really his fist doesn't work on the god very well. Right. So he sends Zebu to go and get dinosaurs, and they <laughs> they, they stampede. Right. And, and this kind of brings success. Yay! Yay! Cool splash panel with all the dinosaurs. That's always fun. Yeah. Oh yeah, that is fun. Um. Yay! Yeah, we have this. We're back in regular old England, and what's her name? Barbara. Yeah, Bobby Morse. Bobby. Who we saw for the first time last uh, uh, last week, land last issue, um, and she's an agent of Shield. And she uh, later goes on to become the superheroine Mockingbird. She marries Hawkeye. She's an Avenger. Um, I like her actually pre uh, Mockingbird a lot better. I think I thought Mockingbird had a stupid costume. And if you have no powers, you've got to have a cool costume. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you have cool powers, you can get over not having a cool costume. But it's the reverse is not the same. Is anybody popular with a really bad costume? Um, I kind of think. I think some villains. Seen. Dr. Light's costume is kind of dumb. Yeah. Um, Graviton. Really cool villain, but yeah, dumb costume. Hmm. Um, Pacepot Pete. <laughs> Pacepot Pete, he's had some different permutations of the costume. Yeah. Uh, he, when he, he's had cooler versions of it. Uh, in the 80s... Or it might not even been that that long, but at some point he re he revamped himself as the Trapster yeah. and had the glue guns mounted on his wrists and stuff, and he looked cooler then. But it's still a guy with glue. Come on. Yeah, he had the worst name, and uh, does he have the worst name in comic film? Bouncing boy, maybe or matter eating lab. Hmm. What? Who, Although, wait, what? Who has the worst name in comic book? Pace Pot Pete. It's pretty lazy. Uh, Radiation Roy. Actually, no, that's an awesome one. He's a Legion of Superheroes villain, and I love that name. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't think uh, those are necessarily bad names. You remember them? Yeah, true. Yeah, I remember yeah. World War Two as I think, well. So. I don't. I don't think a lot of things are like necessarily the worst. I mean, sometimes they're just lazy. Like the Melter. Oh, he melts stuff. Yeah. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think I think you're more guilty of things like that. Okay. Only time a name is bad if it's just kind of clumsy. Sounding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pace Pete, that name sings. Yeah, you know? I guess so. So. It's it's a favorite bad one. It's a good bad one. Yeah, well, he's a ridiculous character. Mm -hmm. So. All right. So, I really didn't understand what happened, but supposedly the girl is from the gods past, and they get together, and they fly up out of the atmosphere, and that's it. So. Yeah, um, the girl from the the Fall People, yeah, Tonga's tribe. I think it's his sister or something. Mm -hmm. She sacrifices herself and becomes the, the the allows the living essence of the evil god guys, um, uh, lost love, and so they she becomes that person, and he stops destroying the world, and they fly away to outer space. Yeah, so it was a happy ending. Yay! <laughs> yes. All right. Beautifully drawn, kind of. I don't know. It should have been the whole comic book. I mean, yeah. Yeah, you know, it's kind of it's rushed, kind of a kind of... lot of plot to fit in, into half an issue of mm -hmm. comics. Okay. Yeah. Next. So we figured out the name, and it's Damon. Yeah. And Melania is his girlfriend. Yay! Yeah. So <laughs> the backup feature in this book is really the one to write home about. Mm -hmm. It is. Um, it is called "And If I Be Called Traitor," written by Jerry Conway. Uh, penciled by Gene Colan and inked by Frank Giacoya and Mike Esposito. And I love Gene Colan. I think he's a great job doing Doctor Doom and the Black Panther in this story. It's a cool, it's a cool story. I love the premise of these heads of state fighting. And, yeah. And that, you know, as superheroes, and I wish that would, would be all over the place. You know, they'd right. be great. Um, you, know, <laughs> you know, they've had... Uh, you know, not like maybe about a gosh, I guess it was a decade ago. Now they had Lex Luthor be the president of the United mm -hmm. States, and how can it be the Superman? Your arch enemy is the president of America. Yeah, you know? and but even then, in the '60s, in the 1960s, there was a short-lived cartoon series called Super President, and the 
the superhero, he was the president. <laughs> That'd be almost very impossible because the president's time is so filled up. Well, and been... how can you not know that who his secret identity is when he's called Super President? Yeah, well, that might be his secret name or something. I don't know. Yeah, I, I just thought it was kind of wild. Was, yeah. Um, but, you know, if we had superheroes and super villains as heads of state, you know, and make BBC World News much more interesting. Yeah. I think. So, yeah. Oh, and there's a, in Marvel Comics, there's a, a different, uh, a parallel reality in, in their Ultimates line, I'm using air quotes, mm -hmm. where yeah. Captain America is the president. Mm -hmm. And that's awesome. I'd vote for him. Yeah, but. The, this is not the same kind of Captain um, Cap as uh, in our uh, in the main yeah. Marvel continuity. That president, that Cap is kind of uh, not uh, not the nicest Cap. He's still a good guy, but man, he's kind of harsh. Well, sometimes you need harsh. No, I mean like kind of way harsh. I can't tell uh, you. Fascist or something like that. A bit. Okay. That's what I mean. Um. That I would like for comic books to do more of this. So this is great, and you know, you can do anything you want to. So why not do this? It's, right. It really makes things interesting. Yeah, I like. I mean, Namor and Aquaman, they're kings too. Right. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, it's it's very uncommon, and it's like I would like to see it more too. That's yeah. interesting. Well, like two super nation, two super uh, hero or villain led nations at war with each other. Mm -hmm. How exciting! Right. So okay. Um, Oh, Dr. Doom has vibranium in his cranium. He wants to get vibranium from T'Challa's, the Black Panther's, kingdom. Yeah. Uh, and T'Challa objects. To yes! <laughs> <laughs> and so they fight, and T'Challa has a gun on Dr. Doom, and Dr. Doom knows he won't use the gun, and so T'Challa says, well, I will not shoot you, and he lays the gun down, and then gets zapped. And uh, like, duh, surprise. Dr. Doom is not above shooting somebody. Uh, yeah, and this is a problem in this. And this also was in the wonderful uh, Daredevil um, TV, series? TV series. Oh, yeah. They had this big thing on... Um, I've seen the one to where um, Scott Glenn comes by and he's his... Oh, uh, Stick. Yeah, Stick. Yeah. And he tells him, you're going to have to kill, and... And the one before that, the uh, Russian um, brother says, you need to kill too, and Daredevil says, no. Yeah. I think Daredevil's wrong. <laughs> I think that some people need to be killed. Yeah. Dr. Doom, Kingpin, as much as I love both of them, they wish should be shot. <laughs> yeah. And often. <laughs> right. Um, and, and it's an interesting thing. It's like, I think once you go to that place, there's no turning back from it, and I think that's a theme that people like to play up right. a lot. I mean, it makes for good drama. And for good comic books, so that you don't kill the guy, he comes back. Well, I'm, I'm saying, like, the the wrestling with that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But, of course, in real life, if we're being practical, of course you should kill the bad guys. Mm -hmm. Duh! Yeah. You know, sure whenever. Policeman, whatever, but, you know, and if a Doctor Doom type character, I'd be shooting him. So, yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, even as much as I like him. I shoot him with tears in my eyes. So, yeah. Because he was cool. Dr. So. Doom is such a great, great villain. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, so there's earthquakes going on, and... Oh. Um, Are we in Latveria or in, in Wakanda? That's interesting. Oh, I see. There's a... Uh, he's thinking about Latveria. That's what it is. Okay, he no, is... No, 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 no. He's thinking about the world, and that's Big Ben, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm going to conquer the world. But yeah. there's kind of an interesting montage panel where we see Dr. Doom's figure towering over uh, Castle Doom mm -hmm. in Latveria, and and then also over the world, which is cool. Yeah, I guess that is. Um, yeah. He is in thought about it. He is in Wakanda right now. Mm-hmm. Because he hasn't gotten away with the vibranium. Yeah. And he monologues himself, and he says, well, I would kill you, but I am tired of conversing. <laughs> so, <laughs> God. And he monologues himself out of the vibranium. Yeah. <laughs> uh, T'Challa is captured, and he escapes. A big fight, a big earthquake, and um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of, I don't know, I, I do... I like monologue and something, especially it's been done by a master like Doctor Doom. Yeah, 
I mean, it's loads of fun. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why supervillains are so exciting and interesting. The monologuing. Right. You know, that's one of them. I mean, if they have, if they're actually have a cool plan or, you know, or neat powers or, you know, whatever. Because right. uh, not just anybody can monologue. Yeah. Okay, so the vibranium vibrates or something, and it's about to blow up. So Doctor Doom gives up and goes back. So and he's a, and Doctor Doom's okay there. I'll get it later. So it's kind yeah. of odd. Whenever he's defeated, it he always just views it as a setback. Like I'll get what I want later. Yeah. So okay, I could have defeated him, but it'd have been useless because he wouldn't have made a good slave. That's what he says. He. <laughs> okay. All right. If um, you say so, Doctor Doom. Now this is a great Kazar that we don't see much else of. The the story ends here, kind of, although it's still going on. Just it's, we don't have the concluding part of the story, or something. I mean, it's still going on, but they, oh, we we did got to do a flashback and how Kazar is started. So. Okay. But it's the Battle of New Britannia. Yeah. Let me give some credits before we mm -hmm. jump right into that story. Um. We're talking about Astonishing Tales number eight. It's the October of 1971 issue, and uh, yes, the lead feature is called The Battle of New Britannia. It was written by Roy Thomas and Gary Friedrich, um, penciled by Herb Trimpey and inked by Tom Sutton. All right. Yeah. Um, so, I, I guess Bobby's trying to um, find Kazar. Yeah. And she runs into a pterodactyl. Not just a pterodactyl, a pterodactyl written by a, a German who's still fighting World War II, fighting against the British who are still fighting World War II, just like the History Channel. Yeah, <laughs> there's a handful of German and British soldiers in the Savage Land who have continued this fight that has been over for 20 years. And 40 they, at this time. At this time? 1971? Oh, yeah, math. Uh, but anyway. Or 30, excuse me. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, math. Well. Yeah. Anyway, uh, but yeah, they they were isolated from the world, and so they didn't know that the war was over, and so they kept fighting, which is an interesting idea. I mean, that's a that's something you, that I've seen in like Saturday morning cartoons mm -hmm. and different things like that. But it's it's a familiar but not overused idea, right? Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, I, it's harkens back to the Japanese soldiers who refuse to give up, and I think. One fall for 20 years. After the yeah. war. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah, I've heard of that. And you think of how dangerous a jungle is. And it's, if you, if you do not live in a jungle and you go there, and it, I mean, you could step on a poisonous snake or a poisonous ant or a poisonous frog. These all exist. And yeah. And there are trees that you put, you just place your hand on, it will pierce your hand because it's, they're so sharp. And yeah. Just, and it's just disease and everything you own will decay. And, um, yeah, I don't want to go to the jungle. I like watching, seeing the jungle on TV. Right. I don't want to go there. Yeah. So, but how are these guys still fighting after 30 years? And The are, answer they, is, it's a comic book. <laughs> yeah. And, um, I was saying, do they, do they get some cave girls and, and procreate? Or they just... I think they were like probably, you know... Teenage guys that fighting in you know volunteered in the war, uh, or very young. Yeah. You know, if you're let's say the average age of them is 19, 18, or 19 or yeah. twenty. Mm -hmm. At thirty years, you could be okay. Yeah, you're pushing. They're not. They're under fifty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So are they like fifty years old? So they've been fighting, and then after thirty years, one of them's better be dead. <laughs> or, you know. It's, one you would, of has got to be defeated. In you, it's, I, it's hard to imagine a stalemate lasting that long, and okay, which is what they would be in. Yeah, and very dangerous land. Yeah, I mean they're at war with you know. People say, "Oh, the Eskimos never go to war." Well, or the Inuits, they're at war all the time. They're at war with nature, and nature takes no prisoners. So you got this war against nature going on, and the war against the um, the enemy, yeah. Germans or British. There's no way. You're gonna survive, right? Especially like think about like think how dangerous the jungle is, and add dinosaurs. Oh yeah, you know, and big other big beasts and yeah. pterodactyls. I mean, you can't just lay in the open; you're gonna get snatched up by a yeah. pterodactyl. So it's Im it's improbable. Yeah, 
Um, but I'd, I'd like to know more about Man, this is great. I love this. And then we really it, hadn't read much more after this. Huh? No. Uh, Alright, so... Um, remember all those movies in the 70s where, like, nature fought back or went wild? Yeah, like, mm-hmm. some animals, like, went crazy. And, the, and that was that was the horror movie's monster, the Deadly Bees, or the Grizzly, or the whatever. The Lepus. Oh, and, yeah. And Phase 5, which is Ants. Phase 4, yeah. Phase 4, yeah. Yeah, I love that movie, actually. Yeah, I read that book. It was okay. So. Yeah. Uh, so, um, Kazar sees the plane going down, and someone jumps out of the plane, goes, and the pilot stays in. Yeah. So he's running off, and, oh, the plane is attacked by dinosaur men, or something. Lizard men. There's a lizard men? Yeah. I couldn't tell if they were dinosaurs, or lizard well, men, or whatever. Well, they say the lizards who walk like men, so... Yeah, yeah, but there are were lizards that kind of walk like men. Okay, um, so I mean they could be just like velociraptors or something. Of, you, know, well, you, know, you know, there are many variations of the bipedal carnivore dinosaur, mm-hmm. and so yeah, so take your pick. Right. So, but K's are and, and Zabu, Zabu, Zabu kick butt. They run. Um, so they find a pilot. The pilot explains that the girl. Bailed out. Bailed out over the... What ocean is this? Or is it... Uh, it's called Lost, Lost Lake. Lake. Hey, we have a Lost Lake in Oregon. Do we? I think so. Did anyone ever find it? So. <laughs> I know, it's silly, right? <laughs> yeah. So no, I mean, she... I people go there, but mm. it's called Lost Lake. Yeah. Um, I think it's in Oregon. Anyway. Okay, so the Germans are riding plesiosaurs. Yeah. The Loch Ness monster type thing. Right. And, and the... Uh, the, look cool as all and the there. British were riding uh, pterodactyls and Deinonychus or something. No, not no, Deinonychus. Archaea- uh, Archaeopteryx. The Archaeopteryx, is this is a huge one. Archaeopteryx were not giant. They were small. Yeah. But. Oh, well. Oh, well. So it's then fun. the pterodactyls come with the Germans on them. They fight. And then the pterodactyls leave. So, um, but uh, the girl's about to drown, but they, they, uh, they take the. Uh, they, British take the girls and they explain what's going on, and she tells them, "Oh, the war is over." Like, no, the war is not over until we defeat them. So. Yeah, like wow. All right, so and then there's eight men that attack. Yeah, Kate. <laughs> so eight men attack and defeated by Kazar and uh, Sabu. Yeah, and that's it. We get a cliffhanger, and we don't have the next issue, no. or, or we don't have the concluding part, I should say. Yeah. Because uh, because stuff. I'll talk about that later. There's a couple backup features. And the one smack dab in the middle is called This Badge Bedeviled. And it was written by Len Wein uh, and plotted by Mike Friedrich. Um, penciled by George Tusca and inked by Mike Esposito. Now this is, it's crime fiction. It's a crime story with a bit slight science fiction or weird strange mm-hmm. tales kind of twist. But um, it's really interesting to me because... George Tusca's probably finest work was his 50s crime comic work. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to see him return to that genre. Yeah, it, it looks pretty good. Yeah, I mean, this is 20 years later. Um, but, yeah. but yeah. It's very dramatic and dynamic and, yeah. and all that. It so it's kind of, a, cool. yeah, kind of a cliche. Two brothers, one's a ne'er-do-well and one's a cop. Yeah. Um, the ne'er-do-well one is robbing a Futura uh, science lab, and he gets caught by his brother. And let's see, does the brother get gets knocked in the head, and both of them are sent down and electrocuted, which usually kills people, but in comic book worlds, gives them superpowers Yay! that they don't know about. Right. So, uh, the bad brother, hair turns white. Yeah. And then he... Okay. So, <laughs> it's okay. Um, one of the cops dies. Mm-hmm. And they know that um, the his brother cop lives. And he knows it's his brother, so... The gang who's in charge of this, uh, Robin, says, Oh, well, they know you're a bad guy, and so we have to kill you. Yeah, and they're going to not just shoot him, they're going to, like, drop him in acid. Yeah. <laughs> Which is like, wow, uh, it seems like an awful lot of effort. 
Somebody yeah. just shows up dead. Well, the question stopped there. I guess maybe if there's no corpus delecti, then that makes the the tail the trail totally go cold. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. No, they don't get doesn't lead back to you, them. You can have a case without a body, but you have to have a lot more. You okay. have to have a lot of blood. I read a story. I saw it was on one of those uh, city confidential or cold case files where they uh, you know those shows like on Annie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they the body was never found, but then they so they couldn't try the suspects until the 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 judge ruled like look. Or, or somebody said, like, look, there's so much blood at the crime scene, there's no way somebody could survive. Right. So they they okay. tried and convicted a person even though they didn't have a body. Yeah. Hmm. Not cool. Yeah. Well, not cool that it was a murder, but I'm glad right. it's... So. Uh, <laughs> I knew what you meant. Yeah. Uh, uh, cold-blooded uh, murder. I yeah, love they, it. Talk about cold-blooded. Uh, they <laughs> showed the guy, um, the evil brother... And they say, oh, this is the acid we put you in. We put a piece of metal in there. It comes up and it's all pitted and dissolved. And <laughs> like, geez, this is what we're going to do to you. Like, yeah. man, I, you, that's messed up. That's some serious sadism to. Right. So, anyway. Yeah, so he, um, the bad guy runs and he is shot. And then his brother shows up and he gets superpowers. And we don't know they why. They get, like, the double the strength of, of the other one. And speed. Yeah. And so in, so in one of them, after, since the electrocution incident, and when one of them's a jam, he can call on the strength of the other one. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Um, and I think this was a tryout to, like, see if people would dig this and continue this series. And to my knowledge, didn't happen. Yep. Yeah. Oh, uh, in-house advertising for My Love. Yes. Can I, how can I live without love? Yeah. yeah. I, I think uh, I love how the romance genre, uh, even though it had its heyday in the, uh, excuse me, the 50s, mm. um, it was still going uh, uh, into the 70s. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love romance comics and I... Yeah, they're, they're okay. I wouldn't want to make a steady, steady diet of them, but they're fun. They are. All right. So some call it magic. That's right. We have another Doctor Doom backup story, and it's the last one that we'll see in this series. Oh. Yeah, um, which is a disappointment because I've enjoyed the, the Doctor Doom stories a great deal. Um, but yes, though some call it magic, and uh, this was, was written by Jerry Conway, uh, penciled by Gene Colan, and inked by Tom Palmer. And now this is a very actually important Doctor Doom story because it introduces the... Uh, his yearly battle with uh, Mephisto for the soul of his mother. Is it Mephisto? It's not said Mephisto in this, but in future so then, stories. I didn't it. recognize him. It looked like you're some character. Comic book demon. So. Right. Um, it, it would be. This is a, a story that would or a, a, an ongoing theme with Doctor Doom would be every year on Hallow's Eve or. Something. Oh, it's um, it's Walpurgis. Walpurgis. Then. Oh, okay. But uh, anyway, he can battle uh, the demon or whatever for his mother's soul. Uh, Roger yeah. Stern uh, wrote a wonderful graphic novel uh, called with Doctor Doom and Doctor Strange, uh, and I'm blanking on the title on that, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But uh, what is it? Triumph and Torment, and um, Mike Mignola, who created Hellboy, drew it, um, and it's just wonderful. Hmm. Um, but this is the beginning of that, and. The demon isn't specified in this story, yeah. so I think we just kind of get a generic one. But typically, it's been Mephisto, yeah. and so. Yeah. Um. Actually, he even asks, "Who are you?" When you know, he doesn't know who he is. So that's right. Doctor Do Doom asks. Okay. Um. So apparently, even Doctor Doom has a mother. I'll bet one who called demons and was taken, was soul was taken. So. Yeah. Well, she was a witch. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. And. Um, Mainly what, so every Midsummer's Eve, yes, yeah. someone says, um, he calls the demons and asks them for a fight or, or to get his mother back. So they give a fight and he, this time, I'm not sure if it's each time, but at least this time, if he loses, he loses his soul. But this, but he fights this stone demon to yeah. a draw and yeah. that's good enough. Sure. We'll try again next year. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
It's kind of cool. Uh, I, I love. I really appreciate the Doctor Doom's love for his mother, um, and wanting to free her soul from torment. Uh, you know, this is an obsession of his. Mm -hmm. And it adds to the idea of that he has nobility. He's not a purely evil guy. Right. He just, he wants to take over the world because he thinks he's the best man for the job. Yeah. Red Skull was, ah, let her burn. <laughs> sure. Um, the Red monster? Skull never loved anybody. Right. But Doctor Doom is in love. He was No. No? No. Oh, okay. So. Wow. <laughs> okay, um... The stone monster looks great coming out of the... Yeah. I don't know, the satanic mist, whatever, but... K. Grob the Killer. Yeah. Hmm. But, oh, so it's a big fight, and... Doctor Doom kind of underestimates the villain, but... Um, villain in this case, I guess, and, um... But barely... Barely makes it to a draw, man, which is pretty cool, not... Not a bad story at all. I really yeah. liked it. There's one really cool house that I want to point out. Yeah. Uh, advertising uh, Conan number 10, I believe. And uh, the first issue of Marvel Feature, which did, was the debut of The Defenders with Doctor Strange mm -hmm. and the Hulk and Namor. Um, just so, okay, that's where we are with uh, with Marvel in 1971. Wow. Um, yeah. Okay. So... Uh, the next issue we're going to talk about is Astonishing Tales number 9. It's the December of 1971 issue. And the story, uh, the Kazar story, is called The Legend of the Lizard Men. It was written by Stan Lee, with art by John Buscema, um, and uh, I think inked by Don Re... No, excuse me, I'm looking at my other notes. John, drawn by John Buscema. Um, now, the previous issue had been that Battle of New Britannia, and that ended on a cliffhanger. For whatever reason, whoever was assigned that story couldn't make the deadline, and so Stan and Big John uh, dreamed this story up. And it's very... it's more, It feels more like a Conan story, actually, with Kazar in it. Yeah. Uh, um, guy in loincloth meets a half-naked... Um, Witch Queen. Yeah. And then, how many times have you seen that? Although, I never complain. Right. Because yeah. Witch Queen is most common. Yes. It's all drawn. Yes. Uh, well, John Buscema, I love anything he does. Mm -hmm. It's great. So, uh, you know, I couldn't tell if she was mean or evil. Although, if she's not wearing a shirt, that means usually that she's bad. So, okay. Yeah. She uses her hair to cover herself. Yeah, yeah. Now, which is why girls have long hair, I guess. I don't know. So, uh, so Kazar has talked to this guy in his whole um, village. Well, part of his village went hunting, all the men folk, and just left him. He's blind, and the women folk back there. And they get attacked, and the women are carried off by somebody. So he tells Kazar, and Kazar is looking for the women. Mm hmm. So he finds the uh, princess. Yeah, they were carried off by these lizard men. Yeah. So. So yeah, the the witch queen. He comes upon her, and she. What does she want from Kazar? Oh, um, I don't know really what she really wants. Um, she likes beauty, so and he's good looking, so she wants him around. Yeah, and but he's like, I'm on a mission. I gotta find these people, mm -hmm. so. So he's oh, I'll fix that, so come with me. And then here comes all these lizard men, and they're fighting, and one of them falls off, and Kazar goes and saves him. Right. Which is, well... What a good pretty, guy. Yeah, what a good guy. So they go to a castle. How did he not see a castle in the... I mean, how big is the Savage Land? Like, the size of Australia? I have no idea, actually. I don't think it's really specified. But also, if he didn't see a castle, that should be a tip-off that there's magic. Right. If he didn't know it before. So. Yeah. All right. So, comely serving girls, which is no castle can be without <laughs> right? comely serving girls, um, scantily clad. And he noticed that one of them is from that village. Right. So this starts a fight because, oh, she's the one who took him. Right. The witch uh, queen is. Yeah, the witch. So, so um, they fight. 
Kazor takes her crown, and if I think when the moon rise, she loses her power. Mm -hmm. So he runs with the crown, and then she tries to send her her minions to go capture him. And um, doesn't happen. She turns. Like, she she turns into a lizard person. Yeah, and she. Which, this is the odd thing about it. All right, you're a lizard person, but you think that humans look prettier. I would think that if I was a lizard person, I would think that lizard people look prettier. But sometimes ha people have that kind of self-loathing. They see some the uh, something else that they could never be uh, as better mm. for whatever reason. So, so that's a thing. Yeah. So. Mm. Okay. People have all kinds of complexes. So. Yeah, the guy that uh, the lizard man that Kazar has saved uh, comes and fights him anyway. So and saving him didn't do any good. So. I don't know. I think because they were under the, the under the right. spell, under the mm -hmm. thrall of the witch queen. So even though he saved that guy, there's he's not going to show gratitude. He's going to yeah. be obedient to her. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she turns back to the lizard person, and the lizard people turn into humans, and the that... spells broken. They were the lost tribesmen. Mm -hmm. So that was a fun story. Yeah, it was. I, I enjoyed it. Um, oh, well. A yeah. bunch of people. No, I guess he lost a few people because Kazar killed them. <laughs> but, um, well, he, they killed, he killed one person, I think. Okay. Which is not mentioned here. But the lizard man was a human, so he killed that. Here's guy. the thing. They're not going to hold a grudge against him because they were right. bewitched. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were under an enchantment. So, yeah. But it should have been mentioned, though. Yeah. Uh, it's too bad... Kovar died. <laughs> what can you do? Or something. Right. Um, all right. Lord of the Jungle Girl and Tom Tom's in danger. Well, hang on. Okay. So, so as a oh. starting with this issue, no more Doctor Doom backups, and it's all Lord of the Jungle Girl reprints, at least for, for the remain for a while. Okay. Uh, what's happened here with this? Story? Were, you, were you confused by this story? Yes, I was. Let me explain what happened to you. First of all, beautiful art. This uh, this material comes from Lord of the Jungle Girl number 14 from July of 1955 with beautiful art by J. Scott Pike, who did a lot of jungle stuff, a lot of romance comics. He draws uh, some pretty dames. Mm -hmm. But w this is a six-page story, or rather, this is the first four pages of a six-page story and two pages of another six-pager from the same issue of Lorna. There was a goof up, something was misfiled, the photo stats, and so this went to print with, you Let's know, two, two partial stories. And that's why you got mixed up, and I was too. I didn't realize it at first. Then yeah. I went and looked it up, I'm like, oh. Well, I kind of figured that's what happened. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't think there's really a whole lot, uh, no need to get into it. Jungle adventure type of stuff. It's yeah. very generic. Uh, it, you've, if you've read one of these or a Sheena or anything like that, you've read them all. Um, but beautifully drawn by J. Scott Pike, who is still working as he still does um, like cheesecake art kind of stuff. Oh, oh God bless him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've read some other Lorna stuff and she's fun. But hmm. again, you know. Yeah. Not a whole <laughs> lot to say. Yeah, not a lot to say, but she's fighting against these drum guys to begin with, and then she's fighting against these reds. And, Comics. And, and, yeah, and <laughs> he, um, one of them says, well, you're a native. You should um, support me against these reds. And says, oh, I'm from Moscow. I'm wearing a makeup. <laughs> yeah, like just to look like a native. That's wouldn't happen in a comic today. No, it wouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's absurd anyway. And it is. Putting makeup on, you can't, you can't disguise yourself as a tribesman like that. No. So, oh, but, um, okay, so that was confusing, so let's move on. Yeah, so, and this will be the last issue we talk about for this episode. Mm -hmm. It's Astonishing Tales number 11, the April of 1972 issue, and uh, it's, it's Kazar, and the take, this takes up the whole issue. It's uh, called A Day of Tigers. It's written by Roy Thomas, uh, penciled by Gil Kane, and inked by Frank Giacoya. Great Gil Kane art. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I must appreciate the women of comics who never dress sensibly. <laughs> <laughs> and she's wearing this red dress in, yeah. in the jungle, which is... Okay. It's not Stop practical. Her. No. Okay. And she's barefoot. Man... 
I think this is in the midst of an adventure. She lost her shoes, clearly. Yeah. But yeah. Alright, so... Was this Bobby attacked. Morse? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, so she's attacked by this big snake. Uh, Kazar attacks the snake, brings the snake up, and eats him. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Bobby didn't want that. He's got who's this other goober with him? Um, it's a friend of hers. Paul. Yeah. Paul is helping. Uh, is he the? I think he's a pilot. Yeah, I think that's right. I think their plane went down, down in, or something like that. In a couple of issues ago. Oh, that's right. Now it's coming back to me. All right, so they eat. Or at least Kazar eats and Zabu eats. I, I think that's preposterous that she wouldn't go for it. She's a shield agent. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> you're correct. <laughs> Thank you. Every once in a while, indeed. <laughs> uh, so everybody is sleeping and eating, or uh, sleeping after they ate. I, I guess everybody ate because he's right. You need to eat in the jungle. So yeah. So uh, Kazar thinks about what's gone on before. Yeah. Lord Plunder. That's Kazar. Yeah. Um, I guess Lord Greystoke's name was already taken. <laughs> yeah, well, Lord I mean, Kazar is, is just, we're doing Tarzan at Marvel Comics. Mm, yeah. So. But, uh, so he finds himself, this is the Kazar's father, uh -huh. finds himself in the Savage Land, finds it some kind of... Like, uh, mystery uh, metal. Yeah, which he doesn't mention, which destroys metal. Yeah, the anti-metal. Yeah. Yeah. And so he cr uses it to create, uh, like, lockets that are together will be a key to help uh, find it later. Because people are after him, after this. Mm -hmm. And the mother is killed. So he gives it to his sons, Kevin and Parnival. <laughs> Parnival has black hair. Kevin has yellow hair. Yeah. So you know who's good and who's bad. Right. And, of course, Parnival Plunder becomes the plunderer, the supervillain. Mm-hmm. And he's a coward in this. Yeah. And so some, uh, I guess they're Russian agents or something like that. Yeah. They try to get the medal and Lord Punder says no. And and the butler comes with a shotgun and Kevin's there too. And he's, and they say, get out of here. And so, but you know, the wimpy kid stays behind. Barnacle. Mm. Yeah. But, um, well, is there anybody named Carnival? I have never heard that. Name. I'm gonna look it up right now. Go ahead and keep talking. Okay, so, um, they gotta run. So, where it's the best place to run to, they split up. Carnival goes to somewhere with the butler, Kevin goes with his father to the savage land, and they go there and they're attacked by cavemen almost immediately, and they're saved by Zabu. But Lord Plunder dies. I really think... Could you not think of a better name than Plunder for crying out loud? This, Look, this I don't is, know. Take it up with Roy Thomas. I know. I am. I'm going to write a, I, I'm going to write a letter to my um, local newspaper. It's a complaint. Yeah. Uh, there's a Parnival Hernandez on Twitter. So apparently it is a name that people use. Ooh. Okay. I am shocked. Okay. Uh, but that's, right. Parnival Plunder and Parnival Hernandez are the only two that came up in the immediate Google search. Really? So... So, Parnival Hernandez, now you're internet famous because of us. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> okay. um, but uh, you'll get our bill later. Uh, <laughs> the yeah. So the, the leader of the evil cavemen is Magor. Yeah. And he's creepy and he's a jerk. Yeah. Well, he was attacked. And he lost his eye due to Zabu. Yeah. And Zabu and Kevin become friends. Yeah. Hey, just like Devil Dinosaur and Moon Boy. Yeah. Only this is before, but. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, Devil Dinosaur is late 70s. Oh, okay. And, and you know, Kazar is actually a character that's been around since the Golden Age at Marvel. Oh, okay. Back when they were timely. I'll be. Yeah. Okay, so... Well, I just... I think Kazar works better. He's like a popular guest star. Yeah. But I have mixed feelings about giving him his own series. Yeah, I mean, I would like to see, like, the Avengers come here or somebody visit yeah. and have a nice long run. But... Yeah, I although I really enjoyed that new Britannia battle. That that was really cool idea. I want to see how it went, but it was kind of preposterous. But we're dealing with comic books. 
Preposterous sometimes is fun. That's where we live, in Preposterous Town. Yeah. So, well, if you want to find that, I think that part two, that's in Astonishing Tales number 10. So. Okay. All right, so, Magor, Magor, uh, M-A-A-G-O-R, Magor. Yeah. He's really wanting to kill um, Kazar and Zabu. I mean, yeah. It's, it, it's, uh, he's an Ahab. Captain Ahab. Yeah, character. and so he and a few other cavemen, they never get mates or anything. They're just chasing Kazar around the Savage Land the whole time. Man, Magor, Magor is super ugly. Yeah, he lost an eye, which would tick me off. And he, just look how monstrous he looks. Kilcain is really doing yeah, some great things. He here. has fangs and broken teeth. Ooh. And big old nostrils, too. Yeah. So. So, they fight, and... Kazar doesn't kill him, so Magar will probably be back. So. Yes. Yes, oh, he will. Okay. But anyway, yeah. yeah Lots of okay. big fighting, and we kind of got the origin of Kazar. Yeah. yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I guess we'll see you in the funny pages. <laughs>